dive into the second week of this series on, uh, on suffering that we're um, doing called Valleys. And uh, I just want to say uh, today something that I said last week that I think is important for me to repeat, and, and I'll probably say it even a couple times throughout the series, but uh, it's a bit of a disclaimer that um, we are talking about probably one of the most complicated, uh, complex things known to humanity. Um, the idea of suffering and pain, the idea of you and I experiencing uh, trials in our life, it's one of the most complex things. And there are people who have written volumes of books. There are people um, who have spoken on this subject. There are lifetimes that have been invested in trying to help humanity understand this. And um, for not a moment do I think that in a few 30-minute messages for a few Sundays are we going to somehow um, be able to resolve this in all of our minds. But my hope is that with all of those together, um, that at some point um, you will find yourself in a place of seeing things a bit differently. Um, you know, one of, my, one of my things I said last week, I'll say this week, I know I'm going to leave things out. I know that um, theologically there might be some things that you say, oh, it would have been nice for him to touch on this. I just hope that you hang out for the whole series so that you can kind of put it all together. I know that for some of you there may be portions, and even today's message, it may seem like I'm not being sensitive enough to some of the suffering that you're walking through. And let me just say, that's the last thing that we want from this series. Um, truly the heart behind this is a heart that our, our team has for everybody that's a part of Summit, that we see people every single day walking through stuff, and, uh, and I walk through stuff, and I feel like the church historically in the last decade or so has not done a very good job of talking about suffering and pain and how we navigate it as, as human beings. And so our heart is truly to be with you in the middle of whatever it is, whatever it is that you're walking through. And so um, that's, that's really the heart behind this. Um, as I mentioned last week, I just want to recap and say if you weren't here last week, it'd be great for you to go back and watch online or listen on your way to work this week or on your way to school, something um, to catch up. But as I mentioned last week, one of the most significant factors in you and I walking through the problem of pain, you and I dealing with suffering in our life, um, has to do with our worldview. Uh, all of us uh, have a worldview. All of us have a perspective through which or a lens through which we interpret our present circumstances and even project what should be happening next. We all build that expectations of where life is going tomorrow and the next day, all of those things, whether it's interpreting our present or projecting our future, all of those are, are driven from or come from our, our worldview. And our worldview is largely shaped by the references or the cues around us in our culture. So one of the things we talked about last week is that our culture in particular has shaped a worldview that's prevalent among most of us that says this. Our culture has given us cues that has framed our way of understanding life that says something like this, that life Life is intended to be full of pleasure and not pain and that we need to pursue our own personal enjoyment with our lives. So the ultimate aim of our life, living in our culture, in our day and age, is that you and I would have enough freedom, that we would have enough opportunity to make choices through which we would experience no suffering, no pain, and really experience pleasure. That's sort of the, the, the deep-seated worldview of, of our culture today. And that, that's been integrated into our faith. We've allowed that to seep into our thinking, even around Jesus. Um, much of our thinking has been shaped by these cultural cues or these reference points that, that have really made our worldview what it is today. Now, one of the things that we saw last week that we talked about that's really important is this worldview, under that idea, there is no category for the inevitability of suffering. Um, suffering happens. We are going to suffer. And when we suffer, it shatters our worldview. It disrupts our perspective of our world. Not only does it shatter our worldview, um, it shatters our understanding of who God is. It starts to cause us to question our basic faith assumptions. We, we begin to question the authenticity of the Bible, whether or not God's real, whether or not God can be trusted. All of those sort of things happen when our worldview is disrupted. So one of the things that we talked about last week is that when we experience suffering, when we experience painful moments, that is part of being human, and our first step is to move forward to reconcile a life of suffering and pain by developing a worldview that allows for suffering and pain, by, by gaining a worldview that understands that that is a part of life and that we can have a category for that, that, that we can actually live a life of meaning and purpose and still experience suffering. So that was what we talked about last week. Um, this week, I want to move to the God part of this equation. And um, 
because the point of the series is us walking with God through suffering and pain. So how does that happen? How do we walk through these moments with God? Um, I think it's really important as we begin this this morning to, to understand that there's sort of a continuum or a spectrum of suffering that we experience in our life. Um, on one end of that spectrum are sort of the daily um, nuisances that we experience every single day. And I'm not talking about the people that we live with. Um, that's not kind, but it's probably true, right? But there are daily nuisances, right? There are daily things that we experience that remind us of the brokenness of our world. There's daily things that take place that tell us, like, all is not the way it's supposed to be, and those things can build. Those things can get on our nerves. That's one end of the spectrum. I'll give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, this past week, I was traveling, and, I, and for those of you that have been around Summit a while, you know, I travel during the week a lot. I spend a lot of time on airplanes, and, uh, and one of the things that comes along with traveling on airplanes is I accumulate a lot of miles, which means um, with those miles, when I fly with particular airlines, I have perks, and so I fly enough these days that I have several perks with, with, with a particular airline. And, uh, and for example, here are some of the perks. Um, one of the perks is that I get to board the plane, the aluminum tube that's crammed with people that flies through the air. I get to get on that sooner than everybody else, right? They invite me, along with all my other status people, to get on the plane early. So recently, uh, Sherry was traveling with me, and we were standing out, and I said, hey, they're going to announce, you know, we can get on. You can get on with me. And she goes, why would you get on? Just, I mean, they're basically giving you more opportunity to sit on the plane longer than you already would. And I was like, don't ruin my perks, woman. That's, they've, <laughs> they've convinced me into thinking that's a perk, right? So let me just get on the plane, right? So, uh, so that's, that's one perk. Another perk is this. When I'm choosing my flight, there are seats that are open to me as a status person. There are seats that are open to me that aren't open to everybody else. So, for example, I know the best seats outside of first class to sit in. So, um, those of you that are curious, 6C, 6D, 17C, 17D, those are the four optimum seats on most 737s, considering they're all configured a particular way. Those are my go-to seats. That's like the second class, first class, those four seats, right? So I get to choose those. I get to pick those. And that's an awesome thing. So I'm always sitting in one of those seats. But I also mentioned first class, and this is what's been happening lately. Enough time in the air means you eventually start getting free upgrades to first class, which still allows you to board early. But this time, there's a different reason for boarding early. Now you board early so that all of the other people can get, getting on the plane can carry disdain and hatred in their heart towards you, right? <laughs> Because you get like an extra couple inches so that you can actually cross your legs in your seat and you don't have to give it into a turf war for this armrest that's neck between you, right? There's like plenty of room. Like I got eight more inches here of, of seat and so everybody walks by and they're just angry and mad. And you've, you've done that. You've been angry and mad and you've judged those people, but those people have been me, just so you know. So those are some of the perks. And so with those perks come some expectations. Um, this week, I was disrupted in my experience of flying and uh, went through some things this week where um, just had flights canceled and wound up having to rebook different things. And all this stuff happened, all to say that at the end of this last week, I found myself sitting in Seattle. And when I looked at my boarding pass, it said, see gate agent for seat. Not only was I not in first class, not only was I not in 6C, 6D, 17C, or 17D, not only did I, I didn't have a seat. And this is an outrage when you have status, right? So I go up to the counter, I walked up there, and I said, hey, apparently I need to see you for a seat. And the guy asked for my name, and he goes, oh, you're gold status. And I was like, yes, I am gold status, right? <laughs> He's like, I'm so sorry, Mr. Williams, let me take care of this and get you a seat. So he gets me a seat, prints my boarding pass, and he goes, I'll put you on the wait list for first class. We'll, we'll see if we can get you there. Empty promise. So I walk away with my boarding pass, I'm walking away from the little station, and I look down, and I look at my seat, and I am in 30F. 30F. 30F is quite possibly the worst seat on an airplane. Like, back by the bathrooms, at the very end of the plane, in a dark corner is where 30F is. 30F is available to everybody, not people with status, right? 
30F. I'm in 30F. And so I'm walking away. I'm like, surely he's going to get me into first class. So I'm waiting. I'm watching the wait list thing. I'm like, they're going to get there. They're going to get there. Pretty soon, it's time to early board. And I have to take advantage of that. So I go and get on the plane. And I make my way to the back of the plane. It is still like soggy, hot, sweaty from the last flight that was there. Like, I get in the back of the plane. And I take off my sweatshirt. I'm you're settling into my seat. I'm like, this is miserable. I can't believe this. Immediately, I stake my claim on the armrest. And I'm looking at all the other guys coming down the aisle. I'm like, no way. This is mine right here. My armrest. I got my space. I'm crammed against the window. I'm hot. I'm using the air conditioning thing. It's not working. You know, whatever. Just like, how does this even happen to somebody like me, right? So while I'm sitting there, I thought, well, I do need to study for this weekend series on suffering. (laughs) Not joking. So I grab my iPad out and I open one of the books that I'm reading on my Kindle and I, I'm just reading through it. And like it, it takes about 10 seconds to realize the ridiculousness of the moment, right? So I'm sitting there and I kind of chuckle. I'm like, wow, first world problems right here, you know? So I pulled my phone out and I sent a text to my wife and it said this. I think I have entitlement issues when it comes to flying. A millisecond later, she responds with this. What in the world, right? Are you kidding me? Like, come on. Like, so, uh, so I sat there, you know, but it's, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's just stuff that happens in life that sort of gets at you, and if they all add up, it, it just reminds you we live in a broken world. Things don't always go the way we want them to. They can be tiring and testing, but those things at that end of the suffering spectrum, they are nothing like the suffering at the other end of the spectrum. Agree with me? There is nothing that compares to that sort of suffering. There's the kind of suffering that nobody wants, right? Nobody wants the phone call in the middle of the night. Nobody wants the phone call from a doctor saying, we have the results of your biopsy. This week while I was in California, I got one of those phone calls. Someone leaves a message on my voicemail, Mr. Williams, we have the results of your biopsy. Won't get into all the details, but I'll just say this. I had already gotten the results of my biopsy two weeks ago. So as I listen to the message, what conclusion do I draw? I'm going to die, right? (laughs) They have a second set of results, and this must be bad, and now they're calling me back. Turns out there was nothing. It was a mistake. But nobody likes that phone call, right? Nobody wants a phone call where a doctor is saying, we have the results of your tests. That's a different kind of suffering, And and we've had, all of us in this room, we've had a front row to that other end of suffering, haven't we? We've all seen marriage suffering. We have seen addiction suffering. We have seen children suffering. We have seen life money suffering. We have seen all sorts of suffering, right? We have watched that sort of suffering. And this sort of suffering is different. And you know how we know it's different? Because this suffering at this end of the spectrum, it evokes questions in us that that suffering over there never does. This suffering causes us to question existential things. It causes these deep existential questions to rise inside of us. We ask deep questions when we're in this sort of suffering, questions we would never ask because we're not sitting in first class. Those questions, the questions that we ask, are what drive us in our life to resolve and try to find some sort of answer to what's happening in our world. The biggest question of all of them is the question of why. When we're down here living in this space, the question we always ask is why? Why? Why the timing? Why did things land this way? Why did this happen to that person when that person's such a great person? We ask why? The Job passage that we opened up with today that Nathan read a moment ago, notice how it begins. Verse 20, why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter in soul who long for death but it comes not and dig for it more than hidden treasures who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden whom God has hedged in for my sighing comes from, comes from instead of my bread and my groanings are poured out like water for the thing that I fear comes upon me and what I dread dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. This passage in Job, Job chapter 3, seven different times Job says, why? And then he goes on these long tirades of why, why this in my life? It's interesting to note this, and you need to know that the question of why is the source point. It is the root of nearly every philosophical or religious system that exists in the world today. 
If you get every religious system, every philosophy, and you boil it down to why somebody developed those ideas or why people think this particular way, the source of it is this question of why. Why? We're always trying to resolve this. Why? And what answers have we come up with? I'm going to take just a moment this morning and talk about four of the prevailing ideas that humanity has developed, not in the last century, but in the last centuries. Like, what have we really come up with as humanity to resolve the issue of suffering in the world and to answer this question of why? Um, here, here are four things. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot some things down. First, um, some cultures in some places have taught that pain and suffering, that those things stem from the failure of people to live rightly. That's what some people have believed. There, there, and there are a lot of versions of this, this viewpoint. Many societies believe this. If I just honor the moral codes of my culture and I honor the God or gods of my culture, then my life will go a particular way. My life will be smooth if I honor the moral code and I honor God. So, in that same sort of culture, in that same reference point, that would mean that if you don't experience good, if you experience suffering or pain, then the logic would go this way. Then you haven't obviously obeyed the moral code, and you haven't honored the God or gods that you're trying to honor. So when you experience these things, when bad stuff happens, it's simply a wake-up call. It's like this nudge that you need that says, you need to change your ways. You need to align to the moral code or to the God who you're trying to honor. The, the idea of karma is most closely associated with this perspective, with uh, the best example of that view. So that's one way that some cultures have dealt with this. Some other cultures teach this. Here's another idea. Um, other cultures teach that suffering doesn't come from past experiences, but it comes from unfulfilled desires. And that those unfulfilled desires are the result of an illusion that you are an individual. Let me just explain this. So this is the basis of Buddhism. This is the basis of um, Greek Stoicism. If you look back in history, this is the way they understood life. The idea was this. You need to detach. You need to detach yourself from all the people and all the material things around you. You need to forget this illusion that you are an individual, and if you do that, then all of the suffering around you will be dissolved. Why? Because the suffering is mitigated because the suffering really doesn't have anything to do with the real you. The real you is an illusion, so just get past the illusion of the real you. So that's one of the other options for dealing with this. Other societies deal with this in a completely different way. There's a dualism, and in this way, they actually remove themselves from really being a part of the cause or, or the solution of the suffering that we experience. Some societies, some religions, have this idea that um, the world is not fully under control of God, nor is it fully under control of fate, but ultimately there is this battle of light and dark, of good and evil, and if anyone in our life experiences suffering, it is simply a casualty of this battle, a casualty of this life of light warring against dark and dark warring against light. And so really, I have no part in this. I just happen to be a casualty of this thing. So that's sort of the, thir the third view that some people have regarding suffering. The fourth one is really dominant in a culture like ours. The fourth one is heavily influenced um, by writers like Richard Dawkins, who would say that life is pointless, um, which would then mean that suffering is pointless that suffering is random, that suffering doesn't mean anything and couldn't mean anything. Richard Dawkins would say this. He would say that answering, and this is, by the way, most secular humanist thinking thinks this way. They would say that answering the question of why is a pointless endeavor because we live in a pointless universe. If we live in a pointless universe, then there is no why that we could ever, uh, ever come up with. So it's a pointless thing to engage in. So the result is basically that we should eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and it was all pointless. And if, and if something happens to you, the answer to your why is, you got unlucky. It was just simply misfortune. Suffering is just a, a chaotic disruption in your life. So those are responses. And, and this last response, by the way, um, this last response denies something fundamental uh, about being a human being. It, it, it defi defies one of the dignifying aspects of what it means to be human. One of the things that makes you and I unique is that we ask questions like why. 
That's one of the things that makes us human. One of, the, one of the things that makes us special is that you and I have this ability to ask why. Embedded in our soul is this desire to resolve questions like this one. So all four of these, all four of these have been presented by humanity. By the way, all four of those seem to find their way into every culture at every time in history. Even even some of us in this room, even as people who would claim to be Christ followers, we could probably say that some of this thinking has even reached into our own minds and we live according to some of these ideas. So how do we really resolve the question of suffering? It turns out that Christianity actually says something very different about the issue of suffering. Um, Tim Keller, in his book, Walking with God Through Suffering and Pain, which, um, by the way, we've got some copies if you want to pick one up at the Resource Center, um, he says this. In contrast to all these other ideas, he says, Christianity teaches that contra-fatalism, suffering is overwhelming. Contra-Buddhism, suffering is real. Contra-karma, suffering is often unfair. But contra-secularism, suffering is meaningful. There is a purpose to it, and if faced rightly, it can drive us like a nail deep into the love of God and into more stability and more spiritual power than you can imagine. So how can Christianity be so different? How can Christianity be distinct from all of these other ideas? It's different because it starts with a different question. See, if we begin with the question of why, that question will always result in a separating. Let me explain what I mean by this. When we ask why, we are setting ourselves up for a separation from God. That reflects, whenever we say why, whenever we begin to to resolve this tension with why, what we're assuming is that there is a God who is removed. There is a God who is distant, a God who is not present among his people. It is like us versus him. When I ask why, it begins with this assumption that this God is difficult for me to understand, quite possibly difficult for me to trust with the levers or the controls of the universe because of the things that I'm seeing around us. So the question of why immediately sets us in a direction relationally with God that says you are somewhere out there and I am somewhere down here and there is this gap in being able to understand why in the world the things down here are happening the way they are you are a mystery and I can't quite figure this whole thing out but Christianity starts with a different question it's a different question Christianity doesn't start with the question of why it starts with the question of who who that's where Christianity resolves the tension Who is the Christian distinctive? There's this quote by Catherine of Aragon. It reveals this very distinct perspective than the worldview that most of us live by. She said this hundreds of years ago. She said, none get to God but through trouble. Somehow, we experience, we draw near to God through trouble. We start the question with who, not why. Like, who will get me through this? Who will be there for me? Who can we lean on? That's where Christianity starts this question. There's this story that's in the the biographies of Jesus, and about a month and a half ago, I was walking through a circumstance with some folks that uh, attend Summit that were pretty dark circumstances, and... One morning, I found myself just asking why, you know, why, just like anyone else does. And as I was reading, I just came to this passage in in Matthew chapter 10, and it's this really interesting place where Jesus has gathered all of these followers around him, these people that are excited about his message, this life that's full of joy, a life that's full of purpose and meaning, a life that brings flourishing to others. And he's gathered all these people around him. They've been following him for a while. They've been listening to his teaching. He's been sharing all of his knowledge and who he is with them. And then it comes to this point where he says, now, I want you to go out. I want you to go share this message. I want you to go tell people who I am. I want you to be the ones that deliver the peace and the flourishing and the shalom and the joy and the hope, which all of these people who have been listening to him, there's got to be this moment of, yes, this is awesome. Like, we get to go do for others what's been done for me. And it's this great moment of inspiration and hope, and they're going to charge out to make a difference in the world. Then as Jesus is delivering this challenge, this news of them being sent out, simultaneously he says to them, but you need to know something. As you go, you're going to suffer. 
As you go, you are going to experience trials, and some of you will even die as you go do this. Talk about a buzzkill, right? I mean, they're all getting ready to go out, and Jesus is like, oh yeah, this is going to be great. By the way, you might die, right? And everybody goes, wait, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, we're going to go do what you did for us. You, but how is this even, even possible? So there's this question that rises up, like, what do you mean we're going we're gonna to suffer? And then Jesus says something to them. It's like he can hear the question in their mind before they even ask it. In verse 29 of Matthew 10, he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Think about the context of this. You're going to go out, but I want you to remember this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are, are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. What's Jesus saying here? What's he talking about? Two sparrows sold for a penny. Well, this is a reference to the Jewish sacrificial system. Can't help but talk about Leviticus, right? (laughs) The sparrows were the cheapest offering that a person could possibly purchase. They were the most, like if you had to ascribe value to something, this is the one thing that had the least amount of value. It still had value, but it was the least amount of value. That's the point that he's making. And Jesus says these sparrows that seemingly have no worth, like zero worth, They will not fall to the ground apart from your Father. But you, you are so loved, you are so cared for, God is so attentive to you that even the hairs on your head are numbered. So in other words, what Jesus is saying is this. Think of how valuable you are compared to these sparrows. Now notice what Jesus doesn't say in this. Jesus doesn't say, like, it's not like he goes, I'm going to send you out and you're going to suffer and die. He sees the look on their face. He's like, no, 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 never mind, never mind. I'm going to go with you and you will never experience suffering or pain. He doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't say sparrows aren't going to fall. He says sparrows will fall. Senseless things are going to happen in this life. And the peace that Jesus offers is not a peace that is free of tragedy. It is not a peace that's free from illness or divorce or bankruptcy or depression or the loss of someone that we love. It is not that kind of peace. Sparrows will fall. These things happen. And I said this last week, and I need to say it again, that we have shoved suffering and pain and aging and death into the corners of our consciousness. It's like we pick up the rug in the family room, we sweep all this stuff underneath it, and we hope to just ignore it until it comes rushing out and disrupts our lives. That's the way that we live. There is no way that Jesus is saying in these passages that we're going to avoid these things. Jesus says sparrows will fall. You are going to have moments in which you just question and you wonder and you say, why is this happening to me? That's life. And when he says this, I'm certain that there's this question hanging in the air. Why? Like the elephant in the room in that moment is the same elephant that's in this room. Why? Why suffering? But Jesus moves past this question. And I think he does it for a reason. When I was sitting with this passage, I just thought, wouldn't it be great if Jesus in this moment stopped and goes, guys, let me just explain to you all of this. And I was sort of thinking about that, and then I suddenly realized this. I realized this. I realized why he doesn't tell them why. Would why really help? Would why really help? Think about this on a practical level. Get, get out of your head, get out of your objections about faith in God and just go to a moment in which you've experienced pain and suffering at that end of the spectrum and the times when you've asked why and think about it this way. If somebody could answer that question for you, would it really make a difference? If somebody could give you all the logic in the world in the middle of a loss, in the middle of heartache, if someone could say, here is something that makes all the sense of what you've walked through, would that do you any good? See, we want to answer the why question, but even if somebody did, even if somebody gave us the most brilliant, most sufficient why answer, it would do nothing for our souls. It would do nothing to comfort us. It would do nothing to make the circumstances any better. Do you see what I'm saying? So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he doesn't even get into the why because the why does nothing for that. In in the passage that we read a moment ago from Job, um, 
There's this scene in Job chapter 4, the next chapter, where Job's friends all begin to come to him. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to explain why. And by the way, as they explain why, beautifully, you, what you see are the four different ways that humanity has tried to explain suffering and evil in the world. All of Job's friends, in some way or another, express those same ideas, and it does nothing for Job. It does nothing. It just makes things worse. It's just hollow and empty. Their attempts are futile. So, we never get over suffering. We never get through it. The idea of you and I having closure on pain and heartache, that's something that our cultural worldview has promised us, but that's not reality. Those of us that have walked through pain, we know this, right? You never get over it. There's never closure. You will walk with scars. You will walk with a limp. You will carry the wounds of pain throughout the course of your life which means answering why will never help you with that. But answering who does. The who question changes all of it, doesn't it? Who is with you? Who is with you? Verse 29, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? Not one will fall apart from your father, and neither will you. That's the statement that Jesus makes. You are not alone. And God is somehow with you. What Jesus is describing is not a separating between us and God, but a gathering of us with God. Right in the middle of the mess, God is with you. And who is this God that is with you? Who is the God that comes to you? Who is this God that says, I'll walk with you through this? Because some of us, we look and go, yeah, what, what good does that really do me? I want you to think about this, that when God made his most significant move toward us, when God made his greatest statement about us, it was a statement that was marked with suffering. God's most significant move towards humanity, his most significant statement was this, a cross. The cross of Jesus is God taking on flesh, God taking on blood and saying this, me too, me too. I'm a God who enters into the suffering. This is why I believe for thousands of years that Christians have clung to the cross as the symbol for our faith. It's why we tattoo it on ourselves. It's why we wear it around our necks. It's why the cross is on our buildings because the cross is this statement of God's willingness to have his flesh beaten and his heart broken. It's this statement of God's willingness to meet us in the middle of the night, in the middle of the darkest night of the soul. When I was preparing this and I was kind of mapping out where we go in this series, I just named this particular message that God works the night shift, that somehow God works the night shift, somehow when I'm in the middle of my darkest night, when I'm longing for the sun to rise and it doesn't seem to ever crest, when I just want there to be relief, somehow in the middle of the darkest times, that's when God seems to do his best work, amen? In the middle of the dark, he's with us in the darkness of night, in the difficult, in the unexpected, in the tragic it's in those places that we experience the depths of Jesus Christ, that we encounter what Nathan prayed for all of us today, and that is a peace that doesn't make sense to people who are watching. That's where we experience that. When Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, he's making one thing really clear. You and I are not alone, not in our suffering. You realize that there is no other religion and there is no other philosophy, there is no other faith construct that addresses the issue of suffering and pain the way that Christianity does. It is completely unique and completely radical. And we may not, because of that, be able to reason why certain things happen. We may, we may not be able to understand why certain things continue to happen, but at least we know what the reason for our suffering is not. When we look at the cross, we know clearly that whatever you and I are walking through, it is not because God does not love us, because the cross makes a statement of his love for us. It is not because God does not care for us, because he experienced all we could and more to show his care for us. The, the cross of Jesus says he understands us, he has been there, and he reassures us that eventually I will wipe away every tear. I have more than what you're in right now. 
I know some of you might say, well, it still doesn't answer why, but it does answer the most important question, and that's who. Who will get you through? The peace of Jesus is not a peace that is void of pain, but it is a peace that is rooted in this idea that what Jesus gives us, the life he gives us, is deeper and it is wider and it is stronger and more enduring than whatever our circumstances happen to be at the moment because Jesus tells us this is not all there is and our story has not been finished and he has the last word, amen? Will you stand with me and let's pray together? As we close this morning, I'm just going to ask you to do something different as we pray. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to invite you to take, um, to take a moment right now and identify that situation, that circumstance. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Maybe it's a money issue. Maybe it's just a, a life issue. Maybe it's a loss issue. Whatever that is, that's causing you to ask why. Like, why is my life going this way? Whatever that thing is that's causing you to go, why? Like, this shouldn't be this way. Whatever's, like, stirring up those thoughts of frustration and anger, whatever that thing is, you're like, man, I just wish somebody would fix this and, and, and take it away. Whatever that thing is, maybe for some of you it's a, a year ago, two, ten years ago. Maybe for some of you it's really obvious, like it's right now, right in front of you. I just want to invite you this morning as we close to change the nature of your question just for a moment. If you just experiment with me and just say, instead of asking why, would you just ask who? Who will walk through this with you? Who will come alongside of you? Who can you lean on? Who do you know that has been there and back? Who? And would you invite him to walk with you through these circumstances. Jesus, I don't think there's one of us in the room right now that doesn't have one place in our story where we ask why. Unanswered questions. Our paths have been altered by him, our futures were changed by him. Our emotions were warped by those moments. Now, right now, Lord, I ask that you would shift our thinking and that we would be moving from a place of wondering why to a place of experiencing you, your grace, your truth, your peace, and even your joy that somehow in the middle of circumstances that we can't explain, we would experience an unexplainable presence from you, your nearness and your closeness and your love and your grace. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. May you experience the peace and the presence of Jesus, even in the darkest of nights. May we be a community of people who proclaim the goodness of a God who meets us in the dark. Amen. Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here this morning. Hang out with each other as you leave. Connect with some friends. We'll continue with this series next Sunday. See you guys later.